My name's Gareth Thompson. Um, I'm a man of many talents. I work for a charity during the week. I run a debt centre and a job club, helping people find work. Um, and on weekends, I do a bit of pro wrestling under the ring name Gareth Angel. To kind of rewind right back, it's always best to start at the start of any story. Um, as a kid growing up, parents split when I was um, six years old. I got two younger brothers. And my mum became an alcoholic. She became quite violent. Um, she would, you know, she would often hit me and my brothers. Um, that was her way of, of disciplining us. Um, I'd take my brothers to school, and then I would pick them up and go find my mum in a pub to get the house keys. I'd take my brothers home, feed them, put them to bed. My mum would come home drunk. I'd feed her, put her to bed. That was life for me. Um, it's not normal, it's, and I don't think it's right. And I think that any person who's been brought up in a household like that, you know, single parent household, alcohol addiction, all that kind of stuff, violence, um, it does have an effect on you. Um, and that was just compounded at AJ. I found wrestling as an escape because for a year of my life in that time, I was being sexually abused by one of my cousins. And my only escape was my grandmother's on a Friday night. I went there or I watched wrestling. Those are the only two things in life that I felt that could help me get out of this darkness, get out of this pain and this hurt. Um, and then at 15, my mum threw me out on the streets. So I'm homeless at this point. I'm living in a skip at the back of Curry's in Keefley. And then I find myself in a homeless hostel and I'm having to fight every day. I'm having to uh, kind of do things I'm not proud of just to get by and just to fit in because I'm in there with people who are doing drugs. I'm in there with people who are self-harming, mental health issues, um, just so much other stuff. And I, I think I became aware too soon in life of the bad stuff in life. And I think it had a massive effect on me and my relationships um, going forward, the way that I were with people. Um, I kind of put this mask on of strength. I wanted to be seen to be in control, that I had everything down and that, that everything was okay and that I was a life of the party when actually you know you'd see me in my bedroom on a night and that's just not the person I was. I was depressed, I was upset, I was hurting um, and I was missing love in my life. I didn't have any of it. Um, that then turned into not being able to keep a job, running up some debts, back and forwards, back and forwards, nothing really stuck. Life just was just a vicious circle of, of, of rubbish until that moment when I kind of stepped through the doors of this church and, and I was like, okay, I need to start trying to tackle this. And up until that point, I kind of felt like I'd been written off because if anybody had seen me or read anything about my life up to that point, you would have gone, there is no way this guy can turn any of that around. Like I'd been written off. Nobody would want to touch me with a, with a stick. You know, I was just like, no one would see any positive in me and my life at that moment. But since then, I've made a conscious effort to improve myself, to improve those around me, to be uh, a guidance to others, to use my past experiences to help others. Um, and, I, and I've seen God really bless me in that. And, you know, and I talk about God as a, as, as, as a friend, as a companion, as, as, as a father, as a brother, because that's what he's had to be for me. He's had to be all that. I've had to find that in God because I wasn't finding it anywhere else in my life. And so for the few years after that, God was, God was it for me and, and I think that as time's gone on and my life has, has clearly improved tenfold since then, um, I can really pin it down to having something to invest hope in and to have faith in and that has really encouraged me and inspired me to do greater things and to be a better person and to get myself out of that hole. So you're a, you say you're a professional wrestler at mm. the weekends. Now, Obviously, you don't just wake up one morning and think, I'm going to be a wrestler. So how did this come for you? Okay, so uh, as a kid, um, one of my cousins introduced me to uh, the WWF and we watched WrestleMania 10 and it was Shawn Michaels versus Razor Ramon in a ladder match. And it was one of the most craziest and uh, just engaging and exciting things I'd, I'd ever seen. And just watching these guys do some amazing things, athletic ability, uh, character work, uh, using this ladder to beat each other up. I was just uh, 
entrenched in it from, from the first second I laid my eyes on it, I thought this is amazing. And for those couple of hours or however long I was watching it, I got lost in that moment. And for me, life just fluttered away and it was wrestling and it was the only thing I thought of and it was a bit of an escape for me. Um, I was instantly drawn to Sean, even though he was the bad guy. Normally kids my age are drawn to the goodies, cheer for the goodies. Um, but from that moment I thought, you know what, I love the way that these guys are able to be superheroes, are able to be characters bigger, larger than life. And uh, there was something about that that's always caught my attention, um, being something that, that I'm not, being able to escape life and rubbish and for a few brief moments be a superhero. Um, so that was what drew my attention to it. Um, I started wrestling with my friends, wrestling with um, my cousin um, and people. We were doing it in, in front rooms on mattresses, we were doing it in fields, we were, we were just doing it everywhere and you know you get the warning messages don't try this at home we didn't listen to those that's what we were doing and uh, one day a couple of videos got put on youtube and someone sent me a message and just said look uh, you've got all the abilities that you would need to be able to do this and um, we just need to train you how to do it properly come to a training school so i went to rwl in blackburn um, and started training there and we, within six months i started running um running shows, well not running shows, sorry, I started being put onto shows um, in front of crowds, learning my craft as I went and uh, that was seven years ago and here I am now. So you, you mentioned Shawn Michaels as one of your influences growing up, yeah. the first match you ever saw. Um, have you had any other people that you sort of uh, base yourself on or had influences in the past growing up uh, of pro wrestling, whether it be WWE or WCW or anything else? Hmm. So um, I was always a big Jeff Hardy fan. Uh, hence the long hair. Um, I used to do the silly, you know, doing in the, the facial hair. Uh, I used to wear the fishnet tights and, and the rocky goth look, punk rock look. Um, I had that already. I was listening to that style of music. So Jeff Hardy is like a rock star, pro wrestler, totally connected with him straight away. Uh, and I started copying all of his mannerisms and all that kind of stuff. Um, I love Triple H. I think, I think he's a fantastic technical wrestler. Um, as my style has evolved and grown over the years, um, I've taken bits from him. Um, I just love the way that everything he does is crisp, um, the way he throws his punches, the way that he uh, kind of carries himself, he carries himself like a champion. Um, yeah, Shawn Michaels, Jeff Hardy, Triple H, The Rock. I mean, like, who is not captivated by that guy? And just the way that he delivers lines, the way that he lays a smack down on people verbally before actually thumping them in the face. Um, he, again, just carried himself with, with an air of confidence and an air of... Um, total control over the situation. He would beat people verbally before he even physically uh, touched them. And then finally CM Punk was another really good influence for me. I just felt that his um, ability to be himself, even though he's a wrestling character, so much of himself is in that character. There was just something about it that when I started touching on faith and trying to bring that into my character, the way that Punk did the straight edge stuff on his on his tape just totally lived his his gimmick lived his character through himself there was just something about his rebellious i'm me and you can't change me attitude that again also uh, really captivated me so i would say those are my five top five Shawn michaels triple h jeff hardy the rock and cm punk so you, you say that your your faith is a big part of your character and a big mm. part of your life um so have you always been uh, a Christian or is it something that came later on in life or? Yeah, so uh, I haven't always been a Christian. Uh, when I was a kid, my, my grandmother was, was a Catholic and I went to a Roman Catholic primary school and a Roman Catholic secondary school. So I'd, I kind of had influences of faith. I'd seen the Catholic side of stuff, uh, been to church a few times, got baptized as a kid, all that kind of stuff. But I never really engaged with it until quite a few years later when I was about 23 and um, I just got invited to church by one of my friends one morning and uh, I rocked up and I'm like yeah I'm expecting organs, I'm expecting pews, I'm expecting a priest who you shake the hand with on the door and you don't see anything else of, I'm expecting hymns um, and all that kind of stuff but when I got there it was totally different, there was a live band, uh, the priest was just a normal guy just kind of walking around, you could, you could have a chat with him as always, just a normal person, very accessible. Um, the community spirit was everyone knew each other, there was a lot of love in the room, um, a lot of uh, community about it and um, in the worship just something just really kind of touched my heart about love and belonging and um, experiencing 
love that up until that point in my life I never really um, had an opportunity to and I just felt kind of like in that moment I, I made a choice to to kind of give it a go and, and, and kind of chase it and see what this whole relationship with God is rather than I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic to tick a box more so the day-to-day -day living it out and, and how that then translates into helping the poor being a good person doing the right thing and, and being positive in life and seeing the best in people because at that moment in time in my life no one saw the best in me until that moment and now I'm seeing the best in others on the back of that. So you said that um, you, you, you ran yourself into a lot of debt mm. um, and I'm guessing that Christians Against Poverty were one of the places you went to that helped you get through that yeah. uh, which is now the place where you work. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that and how, how you went from being a client of this amazing charity to working for them and helping people go through things that yourself have been through. Yeah. How, how did that transition happen? Yeah, so um, it isn't the case of the blind leading the blind. You know, it, it is a case of when I started going to this church and shortly thereafter I got married. And when I got married, my marriage wasn't the best. I was still figuring out this whole being a better person stuff. Still trying to figure out myself and who I was. Um, the marriage fell apart, there, there, was, there was an affair, my wife had an affair and I ended up in this box room, depressed, lost my job and life just came crashing in on me again. You know, people say when you become a Christian, life's a bed of roses, that's not the case. Stuff still happens, life still happens, we can't avoid that. It's how we react and respond to that that defines us and I think that in that moment, instead of sitting in on myself and going into a hole like I normally would have done, I reached out and I reached out to a friend and he put me towards CAP and he was like, Christians Against Poverty can help you with your debt. So they came and visited me, we went through the process and about a year later I ended up debt free. And then I just thought, you know what, like I want to give something back. So I applied for about four or five different jobs within, within the charity, got knocked back time and time and time again. I just didn't have the skills needed to, to be able to do what I was applying for, but I was just doing it at a sheer uh, desperation and, and fearfulness. I'm like, something's gonna happen, just keep plugging away. And eventually I got given a shot, uh, a part-time job on an evening, um, just making some outbound phone calls, talking with supporters, and I took it, took the opportunity. I'd say that's something I've always done. An opportunity presents itself, I grab it and I shake it until there's literally nothing left. And that job, that part-time job, then became a full-time job. That then became three years of working at the charity and I found a new church, um, the Light Church in Bradford. And when I rolled up in there, I was like, this is the church I need to be at. They had CAP stuff going on, they had the job club going on. So I'm like, right, I'll volunteer at the job club. That then became opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to take on more responsibility, like running the course, presenting, um, helping uh, keep people communicated about the course and what's happening. And that then rolled into, okay, uh, you have got all the skills you need to run it. You're now the manager of the job club. Great, cool, right, now I'm running this thing. Then an opportunity arose for the debt center work. We, we'd been looking for a new debt center manager for a couple of years. And um, the leadership of the church came to me and went, guys, we think you'd be the guy for the job we think you've got everything you need to be able to do this would you do it and i'm like yes an opportunity has arose i'm gonna take it and i'm gonna shake it and i'm like let's do it and that was august last year and now i'm stepping into the homes of people who are in the exact same position i'm in who some of them even in worse situations than me but i'm able to sit there alongside them and not lie to their face i can say i know how this feels because i do and I think that that really helps the process. It really helps those people feel like they're being listened to, that they're cared about, that they're not alone in that situation. I'm able to sit in front of my job club and say, bet you right now, you're sat at home playing video games till 2 a.m., you're sleeping in all day, your routine's messed up, and you're in a hole, and you don't quite know what you need to do to get out of it. And they're going, yep. And I'm like, because I've been there, I know what it's like. So yeah, I think God's really used my mess to now become a message for these people and for me to actually be able to step in front of them and say, I've been where you are, I've come out of it, you can do the same thing. It's a message of hope. You said that um, quite a lot of opportunities arose for you. Yeah. Um, 
one of these opportunities that I've seen is being able to put on an amazing wrestling event to raise money. Yeah. Um, how did that start? You know, it's, it's not every day that somebody can go up and say, we're, we're a charity raising money yeah. uh, to help people. Uh, let's, let's put on a wrestling event. So uh, I, I think I need to clarify a few things. So this isn't Cap putting on a wrestling show. This is me putting on a wrestling show to raise money for Cap. I think there's, there's been a few cross wires. People have assumed that it's a cap thing. It's not. Um, what uh, about the thing about cap is when you work somewhere like cap and you see people's lives transformed, you want to do everything you can to keep that going. And an element of that is fundraising. An element of that is raising the profile. It's talking about it to your friends and family, making sure people get the help. I do church talks. I tell the country it's part of my role now is to talk at churches, inspire them about what we do and try and get them on board with the work of CAP so that more people get the help. We've got to get that money from somewhere and if I can do my little bit, then I've got a unique set of skills that nobody else has. I've got contacts, I can put on a wrestling show. We've got other people at CAP who are comedians, they'll put on comedy shows. We've got musicians, they'll put on gigs. Everyone does their own little bit to help raise money and chuck it all in the pot at the end of the day. So I'm like, let's do some fun. Let's do something that people will just come and have a good time at. Let's raise some money at the same time. I've got experience of putting on wrestling shows. I've got the contacts to make it cheap and cheerful. Let's do it, let's have some fun. And four years running now, that's been one of the highlights of my year is my fight against poverty show, raising money for CAP. And I think the whole of CAP head office get excited when I'm like, fight against poverty is coming up. Like, go, oh, I want tickets. Yeah, I gotta come to that, my kids loved it. And so, yeah, it's become a highlight of the year, and I think it's, um, it's something I'll do every year as long as I'm working there. Maybe even if I'm not working there, I'll probably still do it just because I love Cap and what we do. And I'd be silly not to use my strengths in wrestling to take advantage of the fact that I can put on a wrestling show for, for raising money. So, again, working for Cap, you've had a lot of uh, media uh, yeah. thrown at you. Uh, the BBC have been following you around on behalf of Cap recently. Mm. Um, you've had a lot of, you've been a look north more times than I can uh, like count on my hands. Yeah. Um, so, how, how has this come from, from the, the guys at top of Cap yeah. to you being the, the, the media face, say, of um, the, the charity? So, um, I, I think I'd like to say none of it's coincidental and I'd like to say none of it's intentional but I think there is an element of that I think since I've started in the debt center managers role um, the media often come to cap asking for interviews for newspaper radio TV um, and I wasn't in a position two years ago to take advantage of those opportunities because I might have been helping at the job club but they really wouldn't interview me they would interview the job club people um, but what's happened now is because I'm in this position where I'm running both of these centres, I'm in the thick of it. When a report comes out about uh, child poverty, I can speak into that because I've seen it. When a report comes out about fuel poverty, I can speak into that because I've seen it. So when these opportunities land at head office and they go, we need someone local, I'm right on the doorstep and they know I can do it. So these opportunities get thrown at me and it's kind of like, we need someone in the next half hour. That's just the way that, that, that this works with the news stations. They interview you 9 a.m. for that evening's news. So it's very quick. So it's like, we need someone in the next half hour. Gaz is down the street, phone call. Can you do it? Yes, give me that opportunity. Like I've said, all the way through this, I'll take any opportunity that comes its way. It builds my brand, it builds value in me, it builds value in CAP. Uh, if I'm the right person for it, I am. If I end up being the face of CAP and that morphs into a role of its own, great, you know, it's, it's, it's just opportunity for me to be able to sit there and say, I've been a client, but now look at me, you know? And, and I think it's all for the glory of, of CAP and it's all for uh, the glory of what God's done in my life. And I think that any opportunity I get to share what faith and, and hope and an amazing charity like CAP can do for someone, man, I'm gonna take it. So, we're going back to the wrestling. Yeah. Uh, it's something that you've, over the years, you said you started off in a backyard, mm -hmm. um, super kicking people in the face. Yeah. You know, and it, that's obviously built into uh, the, the weekend of, um, of your life. Mm. So, tell us a little bit about Gareth Angel and where Gareth Angel came from. So, my original wrestling character was Crazy Gaz, and uh, it was very much feeding my ego at that point. That character was all about being front and centre, from you know the, the the man everybody came to mid, middle of the attention doing stupid stuff it's gonna happen i'm gonna get hurt 
you're going to get hurt. Forget, you're taking my title. It's coming on with me, but I'm going to kick your ass in the process. It's as simple as that. Got two words for you. Well, it's actually one. Oof, ah, never mind. My belt, my beer, your ass. And it was very much still an escape for me at that point. Um, the character was was me trying to be something that that I thought I was when actually it was it was daft and a lot of stuff I was doing was very stupid. Um, once I started taking it seriously and once faith become a serious thing for me, um, similar to what I said about CM Punk, the fact that he wore his beliefs on his sleeve quite literally, I thought, well, maybe my character should be a reflection of that. Um, and they say that in wrestling. Um, the best characters are the ones that are closer to the real person because it just comes across more genuine. So I thought, well, why not go down the faith route? You know, there's a lot you can do with it. Uh, Character-wise, there's a lot you can do with it st with storytelling. Um, and I just thought it makes sense for me to do that. And so Gareth Angel came off the back of that. The name Gareth is a very rare name in wrestling. I don't think I've met a Gareth who's wrestling. I don't think I've ever heard of one. Uh, who's who's a big name anyway? Um, there might be loads of them down Wales, but up, up here where I am in Yorkshire, there's no other Garros that are wrestling. So I thought, well, that's a unique name. It, people are going to remember that. And then Angel was one I was going back and forth on for ages, um, and it would just discussed and it just dropped and it just sounded right. And I thought, you know what? Yeah, let's go with that. Then on the back of it, Angel Army became a thing. What my fans are called, Angel Cakes was something I've had chanted at me and people taking photos of Angel Cake and sending me it on Twitter. Um, it just became a thing. And I was like, well, I've got to run with this because if it works, it works. Um, and so that's where Angel came from. It just kind of happened organically. It wasn't a conscious decision to use it. So one thing for the audience and people watching, mm. clarify Angel Cakes for us. So this happened in a random match in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in Leeds. Um, I, I get into the room with a guy called Brett Bell and he's doing this Australian character called himself the Outbacker and uh, we're storming around the ring and I'm wearing pleather pants that have got uh, a cross on and some wings and it says Angel on my butt right so I'm, I'm storming around the ring and some kid goes oh he's got Rey Mysterio pants on because Rey Mysterio wears pleather pants with a cross on and designs and it was like quite similar I'm playing the bad guy at this point so I need to address this so I say to the kid through the ropes no it's angel cakes pointing at my butt angel cakes means my butt cheeks in a sense and the crowd took it started chanting it at me um at one point we did a move called a monkey flip where, where the guy kind of kicks me over his like a judo throw and I, I you normally land on your back but i over rotated and landed on my butt as soon as i landed i grabbed my bum and i'm like ah oh, my cakes just playing on it and and then from that point it was a thing Everywhere I went, people are chanting angel cakes at me, and I'm like, well, it's a thing now. I'm just going to have to deal with it. Um, angel Delight was another one that I've had thrown at me as well, just off the name of the, uh, the mix stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, angel cakes, that's where that happened. Okay, yeah, cool. Uh, I just, I, like I say, I just think that it's one of those things that needs to be uh, said and found out about, because it's quite fascinating. Um, also, you were talking about your pants, your leather pants. Yeah. Now, um, Obviously your ring gear changes over the years. Uh, what, what sort of gear do you use now when you're in the ring? So I use, I've gone from pleather pants to tights to trunks. Um, I've just felt that the, the small pants look just is a lot more professional. So purple's my favorite color. So I've always stuck with purple. Um, so as you can see, I, that's where my groin would be. Uh, on the sides, the, the cross and the wings are still there. I'm just going to stretch this out. Um, so like the cross and the wings are still there. So certain parts of the design have stayed the same. It still says Angel on my butt. So it, it's just a natural progression from, from being fully covered. Uh, and I realized that when I was wearing the pleather pants, there wasn't that much flexibility. I would often catch them. Um, it, it, I had to keep getting them re, re-stitched and just you sweat so much in them lots of flexibility and a bunch of other things so i was like well i need to fix this asked a few other guys for some questions like what can i do to make this better and they were like well go to tights because you get a lot more flexibility in tights so i did that but then i still had the same issue just being really sweaty um they kept ripping in the middle um, a few of different things um my waist 
grew and shrunk and grew and shrunk so I had to keep getting it re redone so I was just like this isn't working so then I switched to little purple pants I've had these for about two and a half three years now maybe longer and and, they, and they've done me great and they've been fantastic and I've got all the flexibility I don't overheat um, they're, they're, they're perfect for me and I think it's a really good look and eventually once I've got a six pack I'll stop wearing a t-shirt and uh, well a cut, a cut shirt um, and I'll go topless eventually um, yeah <laughs> so your t-shirt that you wear says mm. pray, eat, wrestle, repeat it does um, what is the meaning behind this and where did it uh, originate and um, do, you, do you actually follow that as, as as an everyday life instead of just from the wrestling is it something that you follow every single day so um it, it's become a thing it wasn't at first it was at first it was a total play on the uh rave eat sleep repeat uh fad that happened a couple of years back um, and then i saw brock lesnar wear a t-shirt that said eat sleep suplex repeat and i was like i could do something with this so i wanted to do the christian twist on it and, and do something that, that would be memorable, that people would look and go, that's cool. And that they would want to wear it, even if they didn't know it was a wrestling t-shirt, they would still go, that's cool. And I think any good wrestling t-shirt is one that people would wear, irregardless of the fact that it's a wrestling t-shirt. So uh, that's where that came from. So the pray, eat, wrestle, repeat was, I was it was a play on words at first, it was a play on that idea. But then as it kept being brought to my attention, especially by other Christians, they were like, that's a really cool message um, that you pray first. And I was like, well, I, I didn't think why I would put prayer there. It, I just did. Um, but then I was like, okay, well, actually, yeah, prayer is, is a good first option um, to pray about something. is a good first option. Eat. Um, there's, there's a phrase in, in Christian terminology about uh, um, being fed with the word. So reading the Bible, um, in, investing in scripture, um, and going to that as to the place where you get your substance from. So praying, eating, getting, getting involved in the word, wrestling. So obviously for me, it's kicking people in the face. But with, with Christians, wrestling is really kind of coming to grips with stuff. It's, it's coming to grips with faith in everyday life. It's, it's going back and forth on, on your heart and your mind and, and what does the Bible say and, and what does, what does uh, other, other scripture say and, and what's God telling you and what are you hearing in your heart and the Holy Spirit and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of that and wrestling within that term is again a lot more than just what a wrestling fan would perceive it to be. For a Christian, wrestling with God is a real thing it's an everyday thing figuring out life is wrestling with god when someone you love passes away yet you need to keep your faith you're going to wrestle with that you're going to really have to go back and forth on that and keep your faith strong so again praying feasting in the word wrestling stuff over and just repeating that day by day is a really good christian message so by accident i've created a t-shirt that for wrestling fans is, ah, it's a play on Brock Lesnar, but for Christians, that's a really good message. Mm -hmm. So it's worked on two levels, and, I, and it wasn't my idea to do that deliberately, but it has become a thing, and I'm gonna take it. I'll take credit for that. Yeah. Uh, maybe it was divinely inspired, I don't know. But um, yeah, that's, yeah, there's a lot more to it than what it first appears. So you mentioned earlier that you uh, you was a bad guy. Yeah, and you're also a good guy. Mm. So now I know that up here in Bradford, you you usually pay, play um, in anyone that knows the terminology of uh, wrestling, the baby face. Yeah. Now, uh, quite a lot of other places around the country, you actually play play a heel character. Mm. Now, how do you work that with your your faith? Because obviously, you, I, I'm guessing you don't want to tarnish it at the same time. Yeah. Uh, whilst you're playing a really good character, you know, how do you work around that? So uh, it's very tough to do that because. Um, Christians do get a bad rap sometimes. Um, if you've ever walked around the streets of Bradford on a Saturday, you'll see people out in the street shouting at people, telling them they're going to hell if they don't believe in God. That's not the way I like to deliver the message. Um, I, I, I disagree with it on a personal level, but it is people's perception of Christianity. And um, when playing a bad guy, it can be too easy to become that. And I thought, if I'm gonna play a bad guy, it needs to be a guy who doesn't cheat because I shouldn't cheat 
it's more attitude, it's more body language, it's more the words I'm saying, the way I'm treating my opponent, the way I'm treating the fans. Holier than thou, arrogance, rather than just being a really nasty person. Um, so it's kind of overconfidence, it's, it's a bunch of stuff that just you just don't like smug people. Who likes smug people? If they're winning and they're telling you they're winning and then in the end they win, you're gonna dislike that person. If it's someone who's fighting up from the bottom and you really want them to win and they're clawing and struggling, then you're gonna get behind that person. So I need to be bad without being evil. So it's just playing on those tropes of being smug, of being arrogant, of being overconfident. And then when I lose and I get my, get, get my two cents, you know, when I get rolled up and pinned because I've thought I've got the match in the bag and then I overreact and have a tantrum, I'm still not being evil, I'm still not doing anything nasty or bad, but within that moment, the fans are then being able to laugh at me and have a bit of fun with it. And then they're less likely to think I'm a bad person at the end of it, but actually just go, yeah, it's playing a character, play along with it rather than actually blurring that line of is he actually just a nasty person mm. because some bad guys do it so well it's hard to tell the difference um so for me i kind of ham it up a bit and just be a bit silly with it and 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 let kids slap me and, and let mums slap me and 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 just kind of pass on that that heat onto somebody else i'm like if i can get slapped and that mum becomes a superhero for that kid then great, I've done my job. But then obviously there's the other side, like say the baby face, where you've got people coming up to you, cheering your name, wearing, like you say, wearing your t-shirts, yeah. showing the signs that they've made and they spent time on, and getting excited about you coming in. Now I think one of the most amazing things that I've seen personally is Fight Against Poverty 3. Um, now, there was a character that came in dressed up as you, uh, everyone were all excited and getting yeah. riled up and as soon as they realised it wasn't you, it was like, oh my god, it's not Gareth Angel, maybe it's Gareth Angel. And then as soon as you came out, BAM! How, how does that feel, you know? Oh, it's amazing. It's such an amazing experience because the thing with the Fight Against Poverty shows is, is I script it, I write it, and there's, there's one thing to know that you've had a payoff because the people there really love you and look up to you and you're a hero to them. It's another thing to know that you've set that up and it's happened at the moment you wanted it to. Um, I think that that's something that every wrestler um, really should want to achieve. It's not all about the moves and the flips and the kicks and, and the best uh, athleticism you can put on. It's the emotional connection. It's the reaction. It's the way that the fans believe in you, genuinely believe in you, especially the kids. That is what every wrestler should, should want to achieve, an emotional connection. Whether that's bad or good, whether they're gonna boo you or cheer you, you should always work for that emotional connection. If you can work 20 minutes and not get a single pop out of the crowd and nobody cares that you were there, you've wasted your time, you've wasted y your energy, um, and, and you've wasted everybody else's time. Just, you need to have that emotional connection. Now in Bradford, I'm not just, a face, a good guy, I'm the baby face, the main event, the one everyone's come to see, the kids are there wearing t-shirts, they've brought signs, the families are there, the parents uh, uh, know that those kids at that moment have got a superhero for them to believe in. When I came through that curtain and I had my, I had my hood up and there, there was a brief moment where I was like, just stand in this because that crowd response and just the way that they were cheering and waving the signs and I could see the smiles on all the kids' faces. I smirked and then I pulled my hood back and I'm smirking because I'm like, those kids have got a hero. Whatever's going on in their lives, same way as me eight years ago, they could be going back home to some really crap situations. But for that moment, for the next 10, 15 minutes, or however many hours that show, three hours in total, those kids have got something to believe in and I know I'm going to come through for them because I, I know I'm going to win because it's, it's scripted. So I know in that moment those kids have reacted to a hero and they're putting all their faith and all their hope and all their energy into me. And in that match I'm going to come through. That's a victory for those kids. It's not a victory for me. It's a victory for them. Their heroes won. And hopefully it inspires something in them to think that when they go back home 
they can be a hero for themselves in their moment. They can win, they can overcome whatever it is that's put in front of them. And I think it's a cliche message, yes, but I think it's totally a true tried and tested message that has been going on since the dawn of time. People love heroes and they have to have villains, but they love heroes. And when a hero overcomes the underdog story, people get a real good feeling from that. And in that moment in front of that crowd, that feeling is there because I'm then thinking, I'm doing what I've always wanted to do. I'm now Shawn Michaels. I've overcome and I'm gonna do it in front of all these people and they're gonna put their faith in something that's real and it's gonna happen and I'm gonna win for them. Uh, it, it, you can't explain it, but in that moment, you, you, there's nothing better. There is nothing better. So you, you've had a lot of matches um, yeah. with, with <laughs> a, lot of, um, a lot of amazing talent on the indie market. Now, what's been one of your favorite matches and why? So, um, I've always said this, it, and it's not for the selfish reasons. So, um, the first time I won a championship in Bradford in Wibsey uh, for BWA, and it was myself versus Matt Slater, and, and it was a match that had been building for about four or five months. We, we played, uh, Matt was the disrespectful, uh, glory hound who'd won the championship and I was kind of playing the boss of the company um, wanting it to be a company that stood for values of like honor and respect and Matt was not that so I was like trying to bring the, the company into better pastures and being like I don't want a champion who's disrespectful and I don't want a champion who's, who's a nasty piece of work so that was the story we were going in with and when I walked out into that into that ring and we we barely touched each other for about five minutes. We, we were just teasing it, not touching, uh, maybe a tie up, he'd grab a wrist lock and he'd jump out. Or um, I'd go for a shoulder attack, or I'd run the rubs, he'd roll out. But for five or 10 minutes of, of a good 40 minute match, the fans in that room were chanting, angel cakes, um, heavyweight, you're having a laugh. Like the fans for that whole time were just engrossed and we weren't doing anything. It was all that emotional connection. And in that moment, we were both just soaking it in, going, we've got, we've got this crowd in the palm of our hands. We can do anything going forward, and they're going to cheer it, or they're going to boo it. And, and we, we went held to leather on each other. We got halfway through the match. Um, I think Matt wouldn't mind me saying this, but he felt at the time that I was a bit undeserving. So um, as the match was going on, he was really sticking it in. Um, and really giving me some pretty solid punches, some pretty solid kicks, um, and I think he wanted me to respond. So as the match was going on, I started hitting him back harder, and he started hitting me harder, and then we get to a point, and, and it's on YouTube, you can go and watch this, we start proper throwing full on bombs at each other, hitting each other, and at one point I'm like, come on, because I got so angry with him. So it's like, in this moment you're supposed to be professional, but he was playing up his character. His character wouldn't be professional and I would be angered by someone not being professional. So it just played off so well. And then at the end of the match, we had this bit with the title belts, because he had two belts. He brought both in the ring, and um, the referee pulled one off him, but he still had the other, and all the kids are going, look out, look out, look out. And I'm crawling up the ropes, and I know for a while I'm gonna get hit with this belt, but all these kids front row, look out, look out, like genuine desperation on their face. Turn around, I get cracked with a belt, he does the Eddie Guerrero, he falls down as well, he's got the belt laid next to him, so the referee turns around, doesn't know what's happened. He's expecting the ref to call the match off. Um, he, the referee doesn't, the referee's like, nope, it's a title match, we'll continue. Um, and then the fans are like, cheer me on and cheer me on. And then eventually I get him up, I hit him with a big move. One, two, three. Like the place erupted. I, 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 it was just amazing. And it was a good 35, 40 minutes. Probably one of the longest matches I've had. But everything went off without a hitch. I don't think there were any mistakes in it, but the crowd was, was the main thing. They were glued in their seats from the second we walked out the curtain till the very end of the match. And it's just one of my favourite matches of all time. So, obviously wrestling is a big part of your life. If WWE hmm. came forward to you and they said, look, we want to give you a part on our roster, yeah. first, would you take that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Secondly, if you got the chance to go on a Raw or Smackdown, what would you go for? I'd go for NXT. 
All right, okay. I'd go for the one you haven't mentioned because NXT is a proving ground, and I think I wouldn't want to jump to the main roster and be seen as someone who didn't deserve it. I, I feel that, again, I'm all about that emotional connection. I think if fans were to see my story through from independence, uh, wrestling in a field with a friend, to go through life and get into NXT, coming up in the in the lower kind of, it is a developmental place, um, learn my craft, um, earn my stripes before jumping up to the main roster. I think, I think that would be a much better story. Um, and I think that uh, ideally that's where I'd want to be because that's where everyone starts these days now. NXT, even some of the, you know, the best wrestlers in the world plucked off the indie scenes starting NXT. And I think it's only fair that if they start there, I should start there too. So um, obviously you do a lot of charity work. Would you, how, would you continue with charity work? How would you continue with that? I think I'd become an ambassador. I think I would use my new audience and my new brand to turn eyes back towards Cap. So I think that I would, you know, people would instantly start following me on Twitter, they would start following me on Facebook, all that kind of stuff. I would instantly become a celebrity in that sense. I would, I would definitely support every campaign that Cap ran. I would turn people back towards a website. I would talk about Cap and the great work that they do. And, and I'd become a celebrity ambassador for them. And I think they'd love that too. So uh, obviously you've got a, um your own creativity your character mm. is that something that you'd fight because i know with the wwe sometimes they do take away things yeah is it something that you would fight to keep your own creativity to keep your character as scarifa angel i think um i think it's more likely to happen organically now than what it would have done in the past because characters five years ago wouldn't have kept their ring names from from the independence whereas now it's a lot more easy for them to do that. Um, the thing is, is that my character's always gonna evolve and it's always gonna have to move with the times. And if my character doesn't fit within the brand of NXT or within WWE, then something needs to change. Um, I think I would, I would try and keep the, um, the integrity of, of, of my personal beliefs intact. I would fight against, you know, if they asked me to become a Satanist, then I'd be like, no, <laughs> and I would fight that tooth and nail. Um, but if I became, you know, uh, happy-go-lucky Johnny Gargano type, uh, loves wrestling, loves people, uh, just a really nice guy, that doesn't conflict too much. Um, and yeah, I'd like there to be the, the angel aspect, but if, if that's not what they want, then who am I to argue with the biggest wrestling company in the world <laughs> who are giving you an amazing opportunity to be in front of millions of people? Um, yeah, I'd try and keep my integrity, but at the same time, I'd be open to compromise if it wasn't too much. So, obviously, rivalries are a big thing in mm. the WWE. So if you had the opportunity to have absolutely a rival with anybody, mm. all the, not, not just current, but anyone that's been in the WWE, or TNA, or any, absolutely anything, who would you love your first rivalry to be? The Undertaker. All right, okay. Okay. Because I think the light and dark story we could tell would be amazing. So what? What? Which Undertaker would you go for though? Like I, Ernst, Paul Bearer Undertaker. I'd I'd, or, I'd go for American Badass. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I'd probably go with the Ministry of Darkness Undertaker. I think that would be yeah. the one to go for. You know, when he was scooping people up and, and changing the characters and kind of uh, converting people, uh, acolytes and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think I think that would be the Undertaker I'd want to go against. But saying that. The dead man character he became about five years ago, when he was feuding with Sean, I think was a really good time of his career. And they had an opportunity to tell that story, but I think that, that I don't know what happened, but they just didn't. Mm. You know, they had Sean come down from the heavens in a bright white light at WrestleMania 25, and Undertaker came up through the floor, and uh, Sean was in white and he was in black, and they, they totally could have told that story and brought in a little bit more of God evil, good, evil, light, dark, um, you know, having faith in, in unsurmountable odds, um, being the underdog against this, you know, evil, dominant uh, character in The Undertaker. Like, I think that would, I'd love that to be my first feud. Um, and I think if you're going to have a feud with anyone, you want to have a feud with a guy who's going to, uh, maybe if you impress them, Make life easy for you. Um, I've heard Undertaker in the in the locker room is like the the kind of judge, jury, and executioner. If you've got him on your side, you're sorted. 
so again, like if I could earn my stripes in the ring with one of the best of all time um, in The Undertaker, then yeah, let's do it. Let's go for it. Sweet. Well, thank you very much for your time, guys. Um, if you've got any last words, now is your chance to give those last words. Um, there's so much in my life that I think uh, I'd be happy to talk with people about. If there's anything I mentioned that you would like to discuss, I'm more than happy to. Um, if you are stuck for help and you need CAPS help, get in touch with them on the 0800 number, 0800 328 0006. Um, and keep your eyes open for GT Ministries. I'm gonna to be touring churches, doing wrestling events and then sharing my life story um, and inviting people to uh, maybe make a decision uh, to become a Christian themselves. And so that's, I'm really excited for that. Um, in Swindon in June, 1,500 people, it's going to be a big deal. Uh, so yeah, so find me on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the next couple of years. I think, um, I think I'm one to keep an eye on. Thank you very much, guys. No worries, man. Thanks for having me.